Hello fellow problem solvers. So today we're going to be doing a problem that's really a theorem by Erdos and Suryani and that I found in the Sierpinski book of 250 problems in elementary number theory. It's problem 250. I also remember solving this in another Olympiad textbook that I had and it's a beautiful little problem to encapsulate some ideas of play. Now here, I would invite you to take a minimum of 30 minutes, ideally an hour, but not more than an hour and a half. If on the other hand, you'd like to go along with us, I suggest you take a preliminary look of 15 minutes. So now let's begin. So this is our problem. For every K as fixed, we need to find infinitely many M and each corresponding choice of signs, plus and minus, such that this is true. Now, one idea you may have is that for every single M, you have two to the power of M possible possibilities with flipping these signs. And the sum can be at most one squared plus two squared plus all the way till M squared which is equal to m times m plus one times two m plus one over six. And on the other hand, it's, its minimum would be this. It would be the negative of this up here, if I'm not mistaken, I think that is right. But anyways, and you would think, well, there are how many numbers in this interval? We have m times m plus one times two m plus one, or three numbers in this interval, but we have two to the m possibility. So every number is roughly how many times will be represented? Well, it's two to the m over this is how much every number will be represented. And this seems to be telling us that every number will be represented a lot. So you might be thinking of some sort of, so, so to speak, density argument here. However, to show yourself that you are wrong in thinking about this, just think about the numbers if instead of this, the problem was two squared plus and minus four squared plus and minus all the way till plus and minus two M squared. Then again, the sum is a polynomial in N and the number of signs we can take, the number of possibilities is a power of M. It's two to the power of M and then this is a polynomial in M. So this will again have a similar density, but we will not be able to get any odd numbers. So that's one idea and the subsequent reasoning for why it's not the best idea to start off with. Maybe it's good to look at it sometime later, but not now. Now let's look at what can we get when we flip the signs. And here I invite you to pause for about 10 to 15 minutes and play around with the signs because here's what we get. So this is sort of what we get. We get one, three, four, five, six. We real, we have two, realize that we have the positive integers, we can easily get the negatives, we just flip the signs at every single point. And if this was on a competition, I would urge you to actually always write these little things you notice, that if we had the positive integers, we automatically get the negatives. And we can also see sort of how these numbers are generated. Like once we get these, how the next eight are going to be generated. And now maybe there is something to this play. But for me, the next idea sort of came out, actually the first idea, is looking at the second condition, which is K needs to be written as this in infinitely many ways, which means that we will get M that's infinitely large, like as large as we want it to be. So the question arises, if we had K in this form for some M, say that this is actually equal to K, what would we do with the next, say, t of these, what would need to happen with them if we are going to just like build up in the most flexible, simple way? And here I invite you to actually take a pause for the next 15 minutes and try to play with this and push the problem further. And here's the idea, like the easiest thing would be to make this k and this zero. And the question is, how do we make this zero? Well, on the one hand, the m squares would need to cancel out. So that means that we would need to have t be even. Okay, and on the other hand, the this is going to be of the form, huh? So this is, say, if one is a plus and two is a minus, and then t is a plus. Like, 
if the pluses are a1, a2, all the way till a sum, a t half actually, then if all of these are pluses, then their sum must be equal to the sum of all the minuses so that we can cancel out the m's, not just the m squares. And then we have a constant term, but the thing with the constant term is that if we get rid of all the m's and we're left with a constant term, we can just add another t of these, m plus t plus one squared, that give us the same constant term because the constant term is dependent on t and here we will be looking at m plus t, sort of as our number that we are canceling out over, and we would have the same sort of thing, m plus t plus t squared, where we would be choosing the pluses and minuses. So now the first sort of thing that you would try out is t equals one. We would have m plus one squared plus and minus plus and minus m plus two squared. And here we can't really do anything, we cannot ever equalize this, we'll have 2m plus or minus 2m and plus or minus actually 2m and 4m, and these will never be equal. So now we need to move on to say t is equal to 2. Let's see if we can do this. And here is actually the place where I would invite you to pause for the next, say, 10 minutes and play around with this and try to actually, with this, finish the problem. And here's the thing. Okay, so two of them need to be positive, two of them need to be negative. And we need these to add up. Okay, so we'll just make, if we make this positive and this positive and these two negative, what do we have? We have m plus one squared minus m plus two squared minus m plus three squared plus m plus four squared. And now what is this equal to? Well, the m squares cancel out. We're going to have 2m plus 1 minus 4m minus 4 minus, what's this going to be? Uh, 6m minus 9 and plus 8m plus 16. And what we're left with is the m's cancel out. This is 10. This is negative 10m. And we're left with 1 plus 16 minus 9 minus four, and what is that? And that is equal to four. So now we have this thing right here. And now we're very close to finishing up the problem. I invite you to take 10 minutes and finish the problem. Here's the solution. So now we have these two things. We have the first couple of them. This is what we need. And just using this fact sort of finishes the problem because this implies that this is equal to zero. So now, if we can write k in one way, then we can write it in an infinite number of ways because we just make the next state zero and the next state zero. But how does this finish our actual problem? Well, because we can write one, two, three, and four, we can just add four or subtract four, whatever you want, really. We can just add four to the next one. So if we wanted to write five, that would be one, plus the next four would be written in this way. So it would be two squared minus three squared minus four squared plus five squared. And we would get a five. If we wanted a six, we would write it as this squared plus four squared. And now we would make add four and we would get five squared minus six squared minus seven squared plus eight squared. And now here we have a six. And now with this, we are basically done. And the way we would go about proving this is we would first prove that k can be represented for every k that's an integer. And then what we would do is then we would prove that it can be represented infinitely many times or infinitely many ways would be maybe a correct way of saying it. And with that, the problem would be solved. I would invite you to write up a solution. And that's the problem. It's a beautiful little problem because it really plays with induction and construction in two different cool ways that when you ask yourself the question, how am I going to represent it infinitely many times? The answer, if you look at it in the most simple way, sort of pops out. And that's that. And as always, thanks for problem solving.